Uh, it is now seven o'clock, which is the starting time uh, for this particular webinar. Uh, we're very, very excited to have our speaker today, uh, who'll be sharing a very comprehensive uh, uh, webinar with us on this particular topic. I hope you will enjoy it as much as I'm sure I will. And in the meantime, while we're going to give our participants or latecomers a few more minutes, we're going to go through a couple of things and as reminders uh, to uh, our patients who visit our clinics uh, frequently. So as you know, uh, we have three different clinics in the LA region, uh, in Alhambra, South Monte, and Wilmington. Currently, only the Alhambra clinic is open. Uh, and it is only by appointments. So please make sure that you schedule an appointment uh, beforehand. We, have, we don't currently take walk-ins. Our South Monte location, as well as the Wilmington location, is temporarily closed uh, to, uh, due to COVID-19 safety precautions. And uh, if you have any questions and you want to reach one of our particular clinics, the phone numbers are shown right here on the screen. So please feel free to give us a call uh, leave us a message if we're busy with another patient, uh, and we look forward to speaking with you. So if we go to the next slide here, uh, you will be able to see uh, that uh, we're now offering uh, a new service, which is televisits. Televisits enable our providers to speak to you over uh, the phone or by web camera. Uh, so that way you can actually still check in uh, with our providers here in the Alhambra Clinic especially for those looking for refills. This is going to be a great opportunity for you to speak to your doctor, uh, for us to make sure that you're still doing well. And uh, it is very convenient and easy to use. And more details are going to be coming very, very soon. So stay posted um, on our website. Uh, check our Facebook uh, and uh, any of our other social media outlets for additional details. And those will be coming to you very, very soon. And in observation of uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, we want to make sure that we keep our staff as safe as possible, while also making sure that you and your family are as safe as possible. So we ask that you uh, make sure to please uh, follow the clinic safety rules when you visit, and make sure to also wear a mask um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And again, that's just a uh, friendly reminder, self uh, Monty, as well as women's and clinics are currently closed uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And uh, it, this really brings me to the uh, next slide here, uh, which uh, I'm very excited to introduce to you, Dr. Ricky Chan. Dr. Ricky Chan is a board certified uh, physician in internal medicine. Uh, he's currently a community track fellow at UCLA Center for East-West Medicine. Uh, UCLA has been a partner of Tsuji uh, Medical Foundation for the past uh, year, especially in this East-West Medicine program. We're really happy to have Dr. Chang, who leads this program for us, uh, as well as on the UCLA side, to share this topic and his uh, take on how to improve your sleep. So without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Ricky Chang. And uh, I'm very excited to hear uh, today's topic. Take it away, Dr. Cheng. Thank you, Kevin, for that warm introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to be here and to present uh, today's topic on insomnia, um, integrative approaches to sleep. I know some of you guys probably have heard our previous talk uh, with me and Dr. Cho on sleep, but it was done in Mandarin. Uh, today, the presentation will be in English, uh, since my English is better than my Chinese. I know I try to do it in Mandarin, but sometimes the medical terminology can be a little bit difficult to translate. So today, I had the request uh, of some people that wanted to see an English version of this talk. So I originally gave this talk uh, last year for the summer course at UCLA for the undergraduate students. And I've tailored it today for you guys. So some of the stuff we'll be talking about might be a little bit more scientific, since we do have a wide range of audience tonight. But, um, but, don't, uh, but there's some stuff I will be presenting at the end um, that's more practical for everyone to, to use um, and to help them improve their sleep. So the objectives today 
um, we'll be talking mostly about, you know, the importance of sleep. You know, we all know that sleep is very important, but I want to explain a little bit more from a scientific background why it is important and why you should get adequate and good quality sleep every night. Um, next, we'll be talking about how sleep affects your body's physiological systems. Um, and then especially later on when you have chronic sleep deprivation, where you don't sleep well, and how that can affect your health. Um, we're going to talk about insomnia, which is a very common um, complaint that I see in many patients. And we're going to talk about some of the common causes and how we can change and improve those things to help you improve your sleep. Um, and also some ways uh, about sleep hygiene from both the Eastern and Western perspective. And at the end, we'll go through some different evidence-based complementary modalities to help promote good sleep. And I'll be doing an acupressure demonstration and I'll be talking about supplements and other various tips to help you improve your sleep. So why sleep? You know, there's a lot of studies on sleep these days and a lot of the things are not really well understood. There's lots of uh, research going on, but we all know that sleep is very important. That's when your body um, has time to heal um, and reset itself. So in a way, it's like a Swiss army knife of health but because without it, um, our health will fall apart. It helps maintain our physical and mental health and sleep is very complex. As you know, it's a set of brain processes that support and restore our physiological needs. Like I said, it is the adequate time for us, our body to heal itself and to reset itself. So some people say, oh, I live a really good lifestyle. I eat really well, I eat good nutrition, I exercise, but I, don't, I only sleep four or five hours a day. Um, that actually can become detrimental because the fact that you're not sleeping well, even though you're eating well and exercising, but you're not giving your body the proper time to rest and to heal because we all have innate spontaneous healing abilities. And but without sleep, your body cannot go through that process. And later on in the lecture, I'll be telling about what happens during sleep and different cycles of sleep and why it's so important to, um, to maintain good sleep, to maintain good health. So this slide is from the National Sleep Foundation. So based on your age group, uh, recommends uh, the amount of sleep that you need every single night. So for young adults, uh, 18 to 25 years of age, um, they recommend seven to nine hours of sleep. And this also includes people from 25 to 64 years old as well. So usually I try to tell my patients to hit at least seven hours a night um, of good sleep. If you can, do eight hours, that's even better. And sleep should be consistent and it should be every night. You cannot have one night you sleep seven hours, the next night you sleep four hours, and the next night you sleep three hours. And that way, because when you do that, your body is not really in tuning and sync with the circadian rhythm. Um, and you, can, you cannot adapt to good sleep. So your body needs that habit of consistent sleep every single night. Here's a diagram kind of describing what a sleep cycle is. So some of you may have heard that each sleep cycle lasts 90 minutes. Um, it always begin. So in the diagram right here, you're in the wake state. And as you fall asleep, your brain waves slow down. You enter the N1, N2, and N3 stage. So the deeper you go, the slower your brain waves go. So you'll enter the non-REM sleep, and then you'll go back up at the end towards the 90 minute cycle to REM sleep. So REM sleep, when we talk about it, it stands for rapid eye movement, is the dreaming state. So when you're in deep sleep, uh, your body is paralyzed, you cannot move. And then as you go into deep sleep, uh, sorry, when you go to REM sleep when you're dreaming, it prevents your body from moving. And as you sleep progressively through the night, seven to nine hours, you have more REM uh, towards the end of the night. So you have more dreaming at the end of your sleeping cycle. So why is this non-REM and REM sleep very important? Um, you really need both to really adequately get good, good quality sleep. So in non-REM sleep stage one, that's the alpha waves, and that's when your short-term memory consolidation occurs. 
So that's stuff that you remember what you did today or stuff you studied today. That's during that stage where things and memory are consolidating together. And as you enter into stage three, the N3 stage, that's the delta waves. That's the deep st uh, stage of sleep. And that's when you consolidate your long-term memory. So stuff you remember you know, when you were a child, uh, your addresses, these are long-term memories. And this happen when you go into deep sleep. And then as you progressively sleep during the night, at the end of each 90 minute cycle, you have the REM sleep, which is the stream sleep state. And dreaming is very important because that's when your creativity, your problem solving skills, um, and sometimes your wisdom comes from, because through dreams, your body has a way of inspiring your insight and it creates wisdom for you. So dreaming is good. So for the younger audience out there, if you're in school, um, if you're studying for any type of exam, remember that sleep is very important when you're learning because you need good sleep before you learn to sort of prep the brain. So you're preparing your brain kind of like a sponge uh, to prepare to soak up all that information. And then you need to sleep after you learn so you can save and consolidate all that new stuff you learn so it forms um, long lasting memory. So you know, as a student myself, you know, medical school and college, I used to pull all nighters just to cram for the exam. But actually those habits are not very beneficial because we're only cramming the information to take the exam, but we're not really sleeping. So it's not benefiting for us to actually remember what you learn afterwards and for good long-term memory retention. So for stuff that you wanna learn for long-term, you have to sleep after you study. And there's studies that have shown that just one night of sleep deprivation can decrease your memory retention by 40%. And this slide is really talking about sleep and the relationship uh, with sunlight. Um, in our modern day society, I call ourselves dark deprived as well as light deprived. I know that sounds confusing. How can we be dark deprived and also light deprived? It's mostly because during the day, we're always inside. Most of us have office jobs, indoor jobs, and we're not exposed to sunlight. You know, we go directly to our house, to the office, to our cars, and we go home. And there's a lot of, um, not a lot of day, daylight association. Um, on the chart on the left, uh, the numbers you see stands for LUX, lux, lumens per square meter. That basically means how bright uh, each light source is. So as you can see, daylight has 10,000 lux. That's how bright it is as sunlight. On an overcast day, it has a, a thousand lux. But if you compare that to just regular office lighting, um, it only has 500. So compared to sunlight, which is 10,000, you can see the major difference. Um, and at nighttime, it goes to zero to one, depending on how dark um, uh, the room that you're in. So why I say that we're dark deprived is because um, at nighttime, we have excessive light stimulation from electronics. You know, we have our cell phones these days, our laptops, uh, television, and they all emit blue light. And you probably heard a lot on, on the news and the media that blue light is actually not a good uh, light because it stimulates your brain and your brain thinks that, oh, it's during the day, so you don't need to sleep. So in order for good sleep, you need to have this hormone called melatonin that's secreted from the pineal gland in the brain. So if you are constantly exposed to this electronic blue light, then the melatonin secretion will decrease and that long-term will affect your sleep quality and how good of a sleep you're gonna get. In the long-term, it can cause a lot of sleep um, health issues. Um, and like I said before, during the day, we're mostly indoors and we're in artificial lighting, which you can tell that is uh, compared to daylight is very little, uh, the brightness. And this is just a diagram demonstrating how the sunlight uh, interacts with our brain. So when the sunlight hits, it enters your eyes, um, it's perceived by this nucleus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Um, and from that nucleus, it stimulates your pineal gland to secrete, actually to decrease secretion of melatonin. So your brain knows that it's during the day, I don't need to secrete melatonin. So some of the functions of melatonin, why besides you know, promoting good sleep, 
that we actually have melatonin receptors in our blood vessel. It actually has a calming effect. It relaxes your blood vessels and decreases your blood pressure. So if you're chronically lacking melatonin from electronic exposure every day, especially at nighttime, um, long term, your blood vessels, they constrict and they cannot open up because you don't have, lot, you don't have enough melatonin in your blood um, and your vessels can harden and can cause cardiovascular disease. So here's a re some recommendation uh, to get some sunlight exposure every day. So in the morning, you want to get natural sunlight for 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so if you wake up, you're one of the daytime person, you can get up earlier, you can go outside for a short walk, um, avoid, avoid wearing sunglasses. So you want to let the sunlight to penetrate into the eyes and into the retina. So it regulates your circadian rhythm, which is your biological clock. So you can enjoy your coffee or breakfast outside uh, in the morning. And then in the afternoon, uh, usually after 3 p.m. or 4 p.m., and if the sun is still really bright outside, you can wear sunglasses. And that can start to tell your brain, hey, the sun is going to set soon. And you're wearing sunglasses to block out the sunlight. So that way your brain is getting ready to encourage uh, the melatonin secretion at night. Um, and one to two hours before bedtime, you want to turn off half the lights in your house, or in your bedroom, to kind of prep your brain that, hey, in a couple of hours, it's time for sleep. So your brain is, you're sending a signal to your brain, hey, get prepared. And some other things that sleep is very important that it, it really directly affects your immune system. And this is just a study about the effects of sleep and sleep deprivation on these different type of um, cytokines. So cytokines are hormones in the body that interacts with your immune system. So they are our pro-inflammatory markers, such as IL-6, interleukin-6. Um, so these things actually promote inflammation, which is not good for the body. So uh, long-term, if you are sleep deprived, you have um, increased systemic, systemic interleukin-6, uh, growth hormone, and cortisol. Cortisol, which is a, a steroid in the body. So you don't want long-term cortisol to be elevated in your blood because a long-term cortisol elevation in the body is also causes a lot of inflammation. And like we talked about previously, melatonin level is affected as well. And this is a, another interesting study um, that they did for lack of sleep and a common cold. So they took 164 healthy men and women and they injected the rhinovirus, which is a very common cold virus uh, into their nose intranasally. And then they did a study where they had different groups with different hours of sleep, people who sleep less than five or six hours of sleep and people who slept more than seven hours. And they found that people who slept less than five or six hours were four times more susceptible to develop the common cold. So if you're not sleeping enough, you can get a lot of colds very easily. And now they know that the flu vaccine is very important um, to prevent the flu, to get it annually. And this study also demonstrates why sleep is very important. So they did a study where when people sleep less than five or six hours a week before a flu shot, they only produce 50% of the antibodies. So the antibodies are what's in your, uh, remains in your body after a flu shot. So if you get infected with the flu during the flu season, your body has a more, a stronger immune system to fight off the flu. So if you're not getting enough sleep prior to your flu shot, then it kind of renders your flu shot to almost be 50% useless. So this could be an interesting um, future thing that we can invent where your healthcare provider, your doctor can track how you're sleeping a week before you go see them to see how you're sleeping to determine if you should get the flu shot at that time, or you can delay it because you haven't been sleeping very well to increase the effectiveness of the flu shot. And this is another study um, by the American Heart Association. They did a systemic review of all the different studies about sleep and what it causes and you know, how much sleep really affects your health. So they found that both if you sleep too much or too short, it actually can affect your overall all-cause mortality and cardiovascular events. So when you, people think that when you sleep too little is what's causing more harm, 
But actually, it's actually when you sleep more than seven hours long term, it's also associated with all cause mortality, total card cardiovascular disease, heart disease, and stroke. So they found that during this review, the average seven hours is the best sleeping period duration of to maintain good health. And this was something very surprising when I did my research on sleep. Um, the w, they did a study um, also on sleep deprivation. So after one night of sleeping four hours, they measured the natural killer cells. So the natural killer cells in the body are sort of the first uh, line of defense against cancer cells. So when you have cancer cells in the body, they're the first one to arrive there to kill it. So if you only sleep, so this study uh, found that after only four hours of sleep, they measured the natural killer cells activity, it decreased by 70%. Apologize. So after this study, the WHO actually classified nighttime shift work as a probable carcinogen. So that's a very scary thought to think about people who work night shift or graveyard shifts. Long term, it can increase their cancer risk. So insomnia is a very common sleep uh, condition, you know, worldwide. You know, we see it in 15% of the population and in healthcare, we see a lot, about 70% of people complain to have uh, sleep issues. And 30% of adults through their lifetime will experience some kind of disrupted sleep. So there's two types of insomnia. So the first type is sleep onset, meaning that you have a hard time falling asleep. And some people will uh, lay in bed at night for hours and their mind is racing, they cannot fall asleep. And other type is people that can fall asleep easily, but they wake up a lot. So this is the sleep maintenance um, insomnia, a lot of frequent nighttime awakenings. But you don't just have to have one or the other. Most people may have two, but they alternate from one to the other depending on their body and what's going on in their life. So some of the most common causes of insomnia that I see every day with patients you know, one really is just stress. You know, we have this overactive sympathetic nervous system that's always kind of running. You know, you're working all the time, you're taking care of your family, your children, you're going to school, we're working a lot. And then we forget to really calm down the other part of the nervous system, which is called the parasympathetic system. So managing stress is very important. If you're able to manage stress well, then your sleep will automatically improve. And also, we're an overstimulated um, society. People drink lots of coffee every day to keep awake because they're not sleeping well, so they drink lots of coffee during the day, even later on in the afternoon or even towards the, uh, the evening to keep themselves awake. But you have to realize caffeine, that have a long half-life of metabolites and a stage in your body. So you can drink coffee at 4 p.m. Some people say, oh, it doesn't affect me. But actually, uh, the metabolites left over from caffeine can actually affect the quality of your sleep. Even though you can fall asleep and you feel like you're sleeping, but you may not be getting good deep sleep from the metabolites of caffeine. And also nicotine is also a stimulate that also can keep you up at night. Um, and acid reflux, so GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease, is also a common problem these days because of poor diet. Um, a lot of people eat greasy foods or fast foods or eating too late. Um, so this can actually act, uh, act, act up your GERD or acid reflux, and that can also affect your sleep. So when you're laying flat, and if you have regurgitation of acid towards your esophagus, it can cause a lot of issues like coughing. They can wake you up in the middle of the night with chest pain. And it could be a scary thing because when you wake up in the middle of the night with chest pain, some people think they might be having a heart attack. It could be just acid reflux. And also leading sedentary lifestyle, uh, not exercising enough or moving um, every day can also affect your sleep. And lastly, poor sleep hygiene. Um, a lot of us think that we have a good sleep routine or hygiene before we go to bed, but most of us don't. So uh, later on in the lecture, we'll be talking about some basic um, sleep hygiene tips that you can use every day to improve your sleep. So this is one of the common causes of insomnia, acid reflux, uh, GERD. Um, some of these people may not um, realize they have acid reflux. Some people may just present with chest pain, or they have stabbing chest pain that can move different places, or they have a burning sensation up and down your um, sternum. 
um, after you eat, well, even after a long time after, you can still have these symptoms. If you're not digesting your food very well, you can still have uh, acid reflux. Some people may present with uh, hoarseness in their voice. They can have a sore throat, which is very scary because people are now having sore throat have to get tested for COVID, right? So even though it's not COVID, but because you ate too much last night, you have a sore throat, you know, it's scary to think that. But, you know, acid reflux could be a cause of sore throat. Now, a lot of people may have chronic cough that doesn't go away or they have asthma that acts up intermittently because of acid reflux. So some simple tips to prevent acid reflux and to improve it is really try to eat um, three hours before bedtime. I know most of us eat sometimes because of work, you know, late at 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. and they go to bed right afterwards. Um, that's not very good because the food is still in your stomach and it's trying to digest. And when you lay flat, everything goes backwards and can cause acid reflux issues. And this diagram just shows some uh, different diet modifications you can do to help prevent uh, reflux, such as like wine, coffee, fast food, sodas, chocolate, all these foods, uh, spicy foods, all these things, too much of that stuff can cause more acid reflux. You want to eat things that's a little bit um, uh, more uh, fruits and vegetables like leafy greens, celery, berries, apples, avocados. So things that are less greasy um, to help you digest your food better so it doesn't go back up when you're trying to sleep. Um, and if you do have chronic heartburn and it doesn't go away and you feel like it's really affecting your sleep every night, um, you can buy an incline wedge pillow. You can find this on Amazon. So it's like a triangular shaped uh, pillow that raises you up by 30 to 45 degrees. So that helps you um, food digest so it doesn't back up when you're sleeping to cause your heartburn. And later on, I'm gonna be demonstrating these two points of acupressure points, REN17 and 23, to help you with digestion and also acid reflux. Um, so these are the less commonly um, causes of insomnia. Uh, restless leg syndrome, obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, narcolepsy, or other REM sleep disorder. So if you feel like you have any of these issues, it's good to probably see a doctor and need a referral to a neurologist or a pulmonologist, which is a lung specialist or a sleep specialist for a diagnosis. So one thing I do want to address, restless leg syndrome is the feeling of your legs are with ants crawling all over them when you try to go to bed. If you have these symptoms, you know, for a long time, you should seek out a, a physician to diagnose you to see if you have restless leg syndrome. Because if you do have that, you probably need some treatment to help you improve your sleep. And if you have a chronic snoring issues, uh, if you have a partner that sleeps next to you, they can tell you if you have obstructive sleep apnea. Because usually when you fall asleep, uh, most people don't realize if they have sleep apnea, it's their bedtime partner that tells them when you snore, you stop breathing. So if you have you know, a, a bigger neck, or if you have really uh, severe snoring, it's also a good idea to see your doctor to diagnose you, just make sure you don't have sleep apnea, because these things are correctable and treatable. So some common insomnia treatments. So the gold standard is cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. So this therapy is a little bit complicated. I want to go through the whole thing, uh, but it's, it's more about behavior, changing your behavior, such we're going to talk about uh, sleep hygiene and different tips. It's all part of the behavioral therapy, so I'll go into more details later. And it's much more um, effective than using medications because a lot of people, they just the first thing they go to when they can't sleep well is they take a Benadryl or they ask their doctors for Ambien or other sleep medications. Um, but long-term using those medications can be detrimental for your health. So it's good to do it through non-pharmacological uh, ways. Um, and overall, the cognitive behavioral therapy has a um, good long-term duration of at least a year when you do it properly every day. And other things we'll be talking about is mind and body intervention. Um, when you combine it with behavior therapy, it has very uh, effective uh, usefulness in helping you sleep. So some of the things we'll talk about later is mindfulness, meditation, tai chi, and yoga. And then sleep hygiene, which we'll uh, talk in details later, setting a routine. And I'll be demonstrating acupressure and some other sleep tools for you. So everyone heard of the circadian rhythm, which is your body's uh, biological clock per se. So in this diagram, it shows you, so this is midnight in the middle. 
So around 7 p.m., you want to limit your technology use. Um, this is because around 9 p.m., that's when your melatonin secretion starts. And as we know, melatonin is very important for good, restful sleep. Um, so, so um, around 7 p.m., try to use less computer, your iPhone, your iPad. So that way you signal your brain like, hey, you know, your sleep is going to be coming up uh, shortly. So it prepares your brain to secrete melatonin. And if you have enough secretion of melatonin, it can make you fall asleep faster and also can keep you asleep longer. So I usually recommend trying going to bed by 10, the latest 11 p.m. and waking up around 6 to 7 a.m. So this is a, a sort of a, a meridian clock based on Chinese medicine. So as you know, in Chinese medicine, we have different uh, organ systems. Um, so each two hour represents uh, an organ. So heart, small intestine, bladder, and so on and so forth. And in Chinese medicine, we recommend sleeping from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And the reason is because at 11 p.m., that's when your gallbladder and liver, so 11 to 1 a.m. is gallbladder, and 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. is your liver. That's when your gallbladder liver is replenishing itself, and that's when it's most active, and that's when qi is the fullest, trying to uh, re rejuvenate those two organs. And most people stay past this uh, wee hour at night, 11 to, you know, after 1 or eight, uh, 2 a.m., so you're kind of bypassing the cycle. And why this is important is because your liver gallbladder in Chinese medicine is the first defense system for stress. So if you're already stressed out and you don't sleep uh, early on time, it further damages your liver gallbladder. And this in turn can damage other organ systems um, in the Chinese medicine point of view. And this is why you probably hear that you wanna get in bed by 10.30 and fall asleep by 11. So you have time to rejuvenate and restore your liver gallbladder system from Chinese medicine. So from a Chinese medicine perspective on sleep, you know, we all hear the yin and yang principle. So at night, your yin rises to a maximum and your yang decreases to a minimum. So if you have poor lifestyle, you don't sleep you know, on time every night, you stay up late, you, you slowly will deplete your yin. So when your yin is depleted, your yang it's, becomes imbalanced. So when your yin and yang is not balanced, you try to go to bed and you can fall asleep easily, but then as through the night, because yang, yin is supposed to hold down your yang, your yang is not being balanced, so it starts overpowering at night and people will get frequent nighttime awakenings, they think a lot, and sometimes you might wake up sweating or feeling really hot because that's all the yang symptoms because you don't have enough yin holding down your yang. So later on when we talk about how do you deplete your yin is through sleep hygiene and good uh, proper lifestyle to replenish your yin. I apologize for, for the typo. So sleep hygiene is very important um, from an East and West perspective. So I'm gonna talk about the West uh, perspective. So bed is really used only for sleep and sex. You should not use it for anything else like watching TV, you know, using your laptop and doing work because your, your brain need to associate your bed just for sleep and sex, nothing else. Because if you do other activities in bed, your brain is not used to it, excuse me. And you want to keep a same daily routine every day. You want to wake and sleep at the same time every day because your body, like I said, is a circadian rhythm internally. It needs to keep that clock regularly every day. So if you sleep at different times every night and wake up at different times every day, then your body gets confused. And then naturally your, your sleep cycle will be um, messed up. Um, and also we talked about this before, having night mode on the electronics around 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, this would decrease a little bit of the blue light exposure from your electronics. But the best way is really just to stop usage altogether. If you're able to do that, just using, stop using a laptop and then try to limit yourself from use. 
and then we'll talk about some relaxation techniques later and we can do some gentle stretching. All these things are kind of combining together to uh, develop a good sleep hygiene for yourself to relax for the day. Um, and compared to the East perspective, same thing, bed is only for sleep and sex. And from a previous slide we talked about, you want to be in bed by 1030 and asleep by 11 p.m. based on the Chinese medicine meridian clock. And then you can massage different acupressure points to kind of stimulate your body to calm and to relax. And I will demonstrate these acupressure points late, later. And you can practice uh, gentle qigong or tai chi before bed. Um, warm foot soaks are also very popular in the Chinese culture to help you kind of um, bring down the qi and relaxes you as well. So mind and body is very important. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of us don't think that your mind uh, can actually affect how uh, good you sleep. So a lot of ways you want to try to do every night is to relax. And you do this through meditations. And there's different types of meditations you can do. There's sound meditation, there's guided imagery meditation, or just simple mindfulness, focusing on your breathing. Uh, one of the exercises that I often teach my patients is the four, seven, eight breathing exercise. Um, you can look this up if you, you want to learn about it. Um, I'll give you instructions. You basically inhale for four seconds, you hold for seven seconds, and you exhale for eight seconds. And just doing two or three breaths of this exercise can automatically just relax you. But if you don't remember the number, that's okay. Uh, sometimes if you're already stressed out at work or you're, you know, uh, irritated or angry, just simply remember to take a few moments to take some deep breaths. Because when you automatically take a deep breath and you exhale phases longer, you automatically activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calming part of the autonomic nervous system. So just remember throughout the day to take deep breath and focusing on your breath so you can relax. So here I'm gonna stop at, uh, for a Q&A to see if anybody have any questions I can answer before I move on. After the session, I will be demonstrating um, acupressure points for you guys. You're on mute, I think. Hello? Kevin, you're... Oh, can you guys hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Oh, okay, perfect, yeah. Uh, I just want to thank everybody uh, for joining our session so far, and that brings us to the first Q&A piece. Uh, following this particular section, we're going to uh, get into some actual practical examples. So it's a good break right now uh, for us to uh, ask Dr. Reiki, uh, we do have one particular question, I believe, from Jeannie, which is, um, what are your thoughts regarding melatonin supplements and their side effects? Would you be able to sort of give us some color on that? Yeah, so um, Jeannie, after the demonstration, I'll be talking about supplements, and melatonin is one of the supplements you can take. Um, but just to briefly answer your question, melatonin is a good thing you can try if you're having chronic sleep issues to help you kind of boost the melatonin level in your, um, in, your, in your body before sleep to help you fall asleep faster and stay asleep. But on top of it is more trying to develop that routine, which we just talked about to help maximize your own melatonin secretion. Because you don't want to use melatonin forever for the rest of your life. You want your own body to actually make your own melatonin. So you can use it as a supplement for a short term to maximize your sleep before you can develop a good routine for good sleep. Thank you, Dr. Ricky. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been really interesting. I think I'm really learning a lot more about, uh, you know, my own habits as well, especially sort of limiting uh, screen time. Do you have any good techniques uh, in terms of, you know, audience here? Uh, how can they go about improving their lifestyle? Um, especially, you know, uh, ways that potentially you can uh, advise in terms of changing habits or, you know, what would kind of help people adapt to this uh, healthier habit, if you would? Um, it takes time and takes discipline, obviously. You know, I think some of these things I recommend, you cannot do it all at one, all at one time. You have to take baby steps. So you have to set a goal for yourself every day. Let's say that, hey, I, I go to bed every day at 1 a.m. So maybe the first thing you can do, let's say I go to bed 30 minutes earlier this week. 
and just set baby goals. You can write them down. And that's what I tell my patients. Just set goals that you think you can achieve every day. And then once you achieve that goal, and just increase it more. So next week, I can go to bed earlier by one hour. So instead of just saying, hey, you're going to bed at 2 a.m. every day, now I want you to go to bed at 10. For most people, that's impossible because they develop that sleep habit for a long time. So just making these small changes a day and just doing it consistently, that's the way to try to develop into a habit. Perfect. And we do have a question here from Dr. K as well. If you have problems on sleep maintenance, is there any good ways that you would uh, suggest to sort of help uh, with, with maintaining sleep throughout the night? That's a very good question, Dr. K. Actually, that's going to be later on in my slide, uh, what to do when you wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be talking about it shortly uh, to answer your question. Perfect. And just, you know, uh, one question I'm sure a lot of people are also thinking of is, if you have already established a habit, let's say when you were talking about the uh, seven hours of sleep, mm -hmm. and some people may think, hey, you know what, as long as every day I go to bed at 3 a.m., I get up at 10, uh, does that actually work at all? Or it's, it's not as simple as that? For a very small set of population, some people can function on five hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. But for most people, that's not biologically uh, possible even though they feel okay for a while, but eventually their body will tell them something's wrong because if you're not resting uh, chronically and you're getting that, you're sleep deprived uh, for a long time, you can develop you know, um, different symptoms um, like pain, neck pain, low back pain. Because I'll see these pa patients who say, oh yeah, I function because they're some of the younger populations say, oh, I sleep only four hours a night, I'm just fine. But eventually your body will pay the consequences. So sometimes you just have to remind them, hey, why do you need sleep? Just like what we talked about, it affects your immune system, it affects how you fight off colds, kill cancer cells, everything, your heart disease, diabetes, everything's all related because if you're not sleeping every night adequately, at least seven hours a day, all the inflammation is going to cause a lot of issues. And then these will be just, and your body will tell you. <laughs> so that's what I usually tell my patients. You know, but if you feel like four hours is all you need, and that's okay. I, I cannot force everybody to sleep seven hours a day, but this is more of a general population. We, we need that sleep. Mm, perfect. And I'm uh, really looking forward to the next part of your presentation as well. And um, uh, one thing uh, I want to remind all of our audience, if you have a question, please do put it in the chat box. We'll get to your question at the end of this presentation. Um, and at the same time, I also want to remind everybody, uh, although uh, Dr. Ricky is a uh, physician himself, uh, we do remind you that your uh, please consult your own physician for details as well as advice and always follow the instructions provided by uh, your own provider. So um, please, uh, Dr. Ricky, I'm really looking forward to the next portion of your presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so next uh, phase, we'll be talking about different acupressure points that you can um, do um, massage on um, before you go to bed or even on a daily basis to help you with different type of uh, issues that you have. So we'll be talking about kidney one, heart seven, gallbladder 20, spleen six. There's a point called onion point, pericardium six, and REN 17 and REN 23. So I'm gonna go through all of these um, individually and I will be sharing um, I'll be turning off my PowerPoint after two points to demonstrate where it is on your body. Uh, one of them on your leg, I want to be demonstrating just mostly on the head, on the, on the hand, I can demonstrate where they're located. So for the first point, uh, it's number kidney one. Uh, in Chinese, it's called yong qian. Uh, translates as bubbling spring. So this point is located on the bottom of your feet. And this point is very beneficial um, you can massage it on your own. You can have your spouse massage it for you. Um, it calms your mind. It helps you go into deeper sleep, and it can also relieve anxiety. Um, a good way to massage this point is actually using a golf ball. So if you have any golf balls laying around, you can just step on it. And when you're sitting on the couch, you can just roll the golf ball underneath your feet to stimulate that point. So right in the middle of that feet where the picture shows is where the kidney one point is. Um, the second point that you can massage on your own is heart seven. In Chinese, it's called shenmen, the spirit gate. So this point is good for also insomnia 
If you have any anxiety or feeling anxious, this is a good point to massage. Uh, because this is the part of the heart meridian, it's good for heart palpitations or any type of chest discomfort. So this point, um, if you see right on your lateral wrist where your pinky is, if you feel here, there's an indentation. So that's where your heart seven is located. So you can massage it with your index finger, your thumb. You can do one minute, two minute. You know, if your thumb gets tired, you can go to the other side and massage the other side. And you don't have to only do this, you know, at nighttime. You know, if during the day you feel a little anxious, you feel a lot of stress, you can also massage this point too as well. Next, two active pressure points. So gallbladder 20 is located on the back of your head. Um, this is a very common useful point uh, we teach our patients because a lot of us get neck and shoulder tension or pain just from using the computer, you know, looking down on your iPhone all day. Um, it's also good if you have a mild cold or a flu um, to massage this point. If you, I know most of us are using computers a lot these days with Zoom calls, you may have like eye discomfort or pain with headaches. So let me show you after I talk about the next point uh, where this is located. And the next point is spleen six, is in Chinese it's called san ying jiao, uh, the triying merger. So this point is very significant because uh, from the meridians, there's three ying meridians that intersect uh, at this point. So this point has many useful uh, functions. If you have any GI symptoms like um, indigestion or IBS, this is a good point to massage. Uh, for the ladies out there, if you have any menstrual issues like cramping, this is also a good point to massage. Uh, but we do want, I do want to caution you guys, if you are pregnant, you want to avoid massaging this point because it could induce labor. So I'm gonna uh, pause. So for the gallbladder 20, um, it's located right, if you feel where your occipital bone is, you'll see the protrusion. So this is your spine. So right where the protrusion is, if you feel down, you'll feel indentation. You can grab your head like this, you can also feel it. So this good point you can massage with your thumb like this, or you can put your hands together like in the picture, you can massage like that. You can massage this point, we just go down the neck muscles to relieve tension. Okay, so this is good if you have a lot of headaches, shoulder pain, neck pain, this is a good point to massage. Uh, I won't dem demonstrate in the spleen six. Um, so just basically find your um, ankle bone on the inside, the tallest point, and use four fingers above the ankle bone, and right in the middle, that's where your spleen six point is. And usually when you massage that point, it's a little bit tender. Okay, uh, next, this is actually an extra point. It's not part of the meridians in Chinese medicine. It's called anmian point. So it's a little bit, it's actually uh, outside of the point, the gallbladder 20. We just talked about feng si behind your neck. Um, so anmian in Chinese means restful sleep. Um, it's located at the superior ganglion of the vagus nerve. So for those who doesn't know vagus nerve, vagus nerve is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's a nerve that kind of help you relax. It helps you digest. So it's that part of the sympathetic nervous system that um, um, basically overacts on. Um, so it's located behind the ear, midway between feng si, which is the point I just demonstrated. And I will show you, it's easier if I just show you. And you can use this point um, along with other points, gallbladder 12 for insomnia, uh, headaches, dizziness, high blood pressure, or other type of mental disorder. So I will show you where this is located. So if you find right behind the ear, you'll feel a big indentation. You go a little bit towards the middle, you'll feel another protrusion right here. So if you press on that, that's where the onion point is. So to kind of give you a relationship between the gallbladder 20 and the one that we just found, so the gallbladder 20 is right here, and this is onion point. 
So it's kind of in between here and your the point of your year. So this is where the imian point is. So this is also a good point to massage. You can massage this point along with the gallbladder 20, feng si, right here, to help loosen all the muscles right here because usually they're very tight from using the computer or iPhone all day. And this point uh, is called pericardium six, uh, nei guan, the inner gate. So this point is very famous uh, for nausea and vomiting from chemo or motion sickness, but it also helps you relieve anxiety, chest pain, any arrhythmias you have. So at this point, you can locate it. Let me get one second. So when you locate your wrist, find the long wrist line right here. Use your own three fingers, measure three fingers down. So right between, when I flex, you'll see these two tendons. So it's right between these two tendons, that's where the, the acupressure point is. So you can massage it with your thumb on each side. So let's say that you're in a car, or in a plane, you get nauseous. This is a good point to massage for nausea. Okay, you can do it on both sides. And this is the two points I talked about that can help with um, acid reflux. So REN17, also known as CV17, Tanzong. Um, for, for male, is easier to find because it's right between the nipple. So if you feel your sternum, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you guys can see. So right in the middle of your sternum, you'll feel a little indentation, kind of like a hole. And right between the, the nipple line, you'll find REN17. So let's say you just ate a big meal and you have acid reflux, you have indigestion. You can use this point, just use your two fingers or one finger just to gently massage. If it's a little bit tender, that's okay. Just don't press too hard. And just gently massage in a circular motion. Uh, this will help actually with also anxiety too. You know, I do this sometimes when I eat too much and I have some, if I have heartburn, then I massage this point and it helps move the chi down to help you digest. And then the next point um, is REN23, is located right underneath your jaw. So right between the jaw, the mandible, if you feel that point, you can gently massage. This is more of a sensitive point, so you can massage this point gently. And this will help strengthen your tongue and also can help with snoring. Because a lot of times when you get older, your tongue becomes um, not as strong as when you were younger. And when you fall asleep, the tongue falls back and it causes snoring. Okay, so that's the conclusion of the demonstrations for those acupressure points. Hopefully you found some of those points useful. You can try it on your own um, to see if it helps you with any type of symptoms you have. Um, so one thing we talked about is, you know, developing a good um, sleep routine or hygiene for yourself. So Tai Chi, as you heard, is very popular. You know, Tai Chi is a form of Qigong. And lots of studies have been done that it improves immunity, it reduces inflammation, uh, reduces stress, and anxiety, and just overall helps you better uh, improve your sleep and your overall well-being. So, you know, the principles of Tai Chi and Qigong is really just to, the slow movement moves your Qi. And these slow movements, when you move your Qi, everything improves. And there's um, some resources I will give you guys. You guys can uh, look on YouTube. Uh, there are some links you can try to do Qigong, some basic Qigong or Tai Chi. And for the last portion, I'll be talking about supplements. Um, I'm not going to go into details about these supplements too much, just a little bit of general information. Uh, I know someone asked a little bit about melatonin. Uh, so melatonin, as you know, is good for regulating your circadian rhythm, helps you mediate your sleep and your dreaming. Um, so if you are interested in taking melatonin, I will suggest a smaller dose, start with 0.3 to 1 milligram, because a lot of people will start with 5 milligrams, it might be too high initially if you've never taken it before. You can actually get a melatonin hangover the next day. You can feel actually more tired. 
Um, so start with a small dose and take it 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime. And any brands are fine. You can find them on Amazon. There's different brands you can do and it's fairly cheap for a three month supply. Lemon balm, um, I recommend patients uh, to take this if they have long-term insomnia. Um, it comes in a liquid, you drop it in water, and it helps you, it has sort of a sedative effect, uh, it also relieves anxiety. Uh, it comes in other um, forms like capsules too as well. I've tried the, myself, the tincture form where I drop in water. I like it, it actually calms me before I go to bed. And I take something else uh, also at times to help me calm when, I, when I'm stressed out too as well. And this is the magnesium that I also recommend patients. So magnesium itself, it's an uh, electrolyte. So a lot of times we lack magnesium because a lot of us drink coffee or different things. And um, so we lose a lot of electrolytes in our urine. So this Calm brand is pretty popular. You can buy it on Amazon, um, Whole Foods. Uh, it comes in powder form, capsule form, or gummies. I like the powder form because you can mix it with water. It's a little bit fizzy and there's no sugar in it. Uh, you can take it before bed um, to help you calm down. It relaxes the muscles um, and also relaxes your nerves to help with sleep. So you can either try calm or you can try with lemon balm, either or you're going to have to do both. And lavender, which is very popular these days, it comes in essential oil, it comes in a tea form. So if you're a tea drinker, you can buy uh, dried lavender, uh, lavender uh, tea bags to drink, and it also helps you relax. And if you like aromatherapy, you can use uh, lavender oil in your aromatherapy diffuser you know, to create a good sleeping environment for you. And chamomile is a very common tea that you can buy just in supermarkets. You can drink that. Um, it has anti-anxiety effects. It's a sedative. So all these things you can try depends on your preference to do before you go to bed to help you go to sleep. Ashwagandha is another thing you can try. Um, it's more of a adaptogenic uh, herb. If you're very, very stressed out, you feel like your body is not responding well to stress, uh, this is a good herb to try to help you uh, relieve stress. And then another thing to help you relax is aromatherapy. So many of us, you know, you can buy the diffusers on Amazon or Costco, they all sell it. And you can buy different oils that you like um, to use the aromatherapy to help you relax before bed. And another thing about sleep, to help you uh, get, from a Western scientific point of view, good, good sleep, you wanna drop your body core temperature by one degree Celsius to induce good sleep. So some of the ways you can do that to decrease your body temperature is you can try taking a hot shower or a hot bath. Um, you can add Epsom salt. So Epsom salt is another form of magnesium. You can buy it at Walgreens or CVS in a big bag of a few dollars. So Epsom salt contains magnesium. So when you soak um, magnesium uh, in a bath, your skin absorbs the magnesium and also has good benefits of relax, uh, relaxing your muscles and calming your nerves. And if you have access to a sauna, sauna is a good way to bring that heat in and to relieve heat. And foot soaks that I just mentioned, you can add essential oils and also Epsom salts. So these all three ways are good ways of decreasing your body temperature because when you use as hot methods, it vasodilates your um, blood vessels and heat is released. So when the heat's released, your internal core temperature will drop and it helps you uh, promote good sleep. And make sure that your room is not too hot when you go to bed. It's just comfortable enough for you to go to sleep. And some other sleep tips that we talk about, um, you can do some gentle exercise before bed, like 10 minutes of aerobic exercise. You can go for a walk after you eat dinner, uh, maybe a little bit of cycling, but not too, not too intense. It can improve your nighttime sleep quality. You don't wanna do a full workout before you go to bed because you can activate your sympathetic nervous system. It can be really hard to fall asleep afterwards. And then you can do Tai Chi or Qigong before you go to bed. Um, if you do take daytime naps, you want to limit it to 30 minutes and do it after lunch, but not too late in the day. If you do it too late in the day, it can disrupt your sleep cycle and it can affect your sleep quality at night. Um, 
And foods, you want to avoid very rich, heavy foods at dinner, fatty or fried meals, spicy dishes, citrus fruits, because all of these things can actually trigger heartburn and can affect your sleep. And also, it's also can affect your digestion. So if you're not digesting your food well, you can wake up and not sleep very well. And just making sure that your bedroom where you sleep is a very relaxing environment. Uh, make sure you don't have a lot of lights. Some people sleep with lights, uh, with the alarm that has bright lights. I suggest not using those lights because it can actually affect um, your melatonin secretion. Uh, make sure your windows are darkened. You don't have a lot of light coming from the outside. You can use white noise apps to have noises around the room. You can use earplugs to help you promote a good environment for sleep. And just learn to relax every day. Just take five minutes, you know, 10 minutes, just relax for the day. Um, because the more you learn to relax, the better your sleep will improve over time. And read a book and don't read an electronic tablet because if you read an iPad, you're stimulating your brain again with blue light and that's going to affect your melatonin secretion. Um, this is a good sleep posture uh, based on a study. But you want to sleep on your side and sometimes you can put a pillow between your leg and this helps call the glymphatic waste uh, drainage. So this is the waste system within your lymph, um, kind of like your lymphatic system because we have our lymph nodes everywhere. So they also have a clearance system at night. So this is the best sleep position to help drain the waste when you're sleeping. So Dr. K asks this question. So what do you do when you have nighttime awakenings? So first thing that I suggest uh, people is don't look at the clock. Um, so if you don't have those bright light clocks in the bedroom, that's good. If, you, if it's, you're sleeping in the dark, don't reach for your phone to see what time it is. If you already have an alarm set for the next morning, it will go off. So if you do wake up, because if you look at the clock and you have to wake up at 6 a.m. and it's already 3 a.m., you're going to make yourself panic and have more anxiety. And then it's going to be very hard to fall back asleep. So just not knowing what time it is is actually the best way that you can, and some of the things you want to do is if you cannot fall back asleep after a few minutes, get out of bed, go outside, um, make sure you don't turn too, too many lights on, just make sure it's still very dim. You can read a book, you can do some meditation, you can do some deep breathing, and then do that until you feel sleepy, then going back to bed. Because most of the times when we, don't, we can't fall asleep, we wake up, we reach for our phone, we start scrolling through Facebook or whatever. Um, that's actually not good because you you're stimulating your brain again. Oh, wait, it's morning again. And it's very hard to fall asleep with that. So just avoid electronics, not to browse on the electronics, you know, so forth. And then just practice these, you know, every day. You know, every day you want to wake up with gratitude. Um, you can do a gratitude meditation, just, you know, be grateful with what you have. Some people like to do gratitude journal, writing different things down every day, like five things you're grateful for. You know, I think this is also a good practice, you know, being the, how crazy the world is these days with COVID-19 and now the, all the looting and the riots, you know, just think, thinking about the good things that you have in your life is good to also help with sleep. You know, when you have gratitude for in your life, then automatically relaxes you and you're not so over anxious and overworked, uh, which can also affect your sleep quality. And just remember to take deep breaths throughout the day. You know, it's better to do it throughout the day, three minutes, you know, throughout the day than doing 20 minutes at a time. Then you're constantly reminding yourself, I need to relax and calm down. Some of these are the apps that I recommend my patients. Um, I use the sleep cycle myself. It uses the microphone you can set next to your nightstand. It's a, uh, it tracks your movement and your sound. It even records if you snore. And just so you can keep track how much, how, how much, how much time you're spending every day sleeping. Um, Inside Timer is good to use. has lots of different content for meditation and music for sleep. And right now, because of COVID-19, I think Calm and Headspace has a lot of free content you can use. I did find a Chinese app you can use. Uh, it's called Jiandan Mingxiang. You can download this app. It has a, some free trial content you can use to help you sleep. That's in Chinese uh, for those who preferred uh, Mandarin. And then this is a CBTI, the behavior thing you can download. It developed by the Veteran Hospital to develop some good sleep hygiene. Uh, these are some resources that I use um, for my talk. So this will conclude 
our my webinar for today. Any other questions I can answer? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Ricky Chang, and uh, it's been uh, such a such an informative presentation. I, I'm certainly taking a lot of notes myself. I think, you know, given the technology world, and especially when people are working from home uh, these days during the curfews, during the pandemic, certainly sticking to a good healthy habit is very important to all of us, especially when it comes to a sleeping cycle. Um, so we do have uh, a couple of questions here. Uh, okay. one, one particular one I, I thought was really quite interesting, I think really highlights how uh, it's very reflective of uh, many people, I'm sure. And the question is, I really like drinking iced coffee at night, but I had difficulty falling asleep before 1 a.m. What is your suggestion? And now this is the key point. Uh, he said he's not going to quit drinking coffee, though. So, so what, would you, what would you suggest? Well, if you can't quit drinking coffee, then you can still try using the different methods of med meditating before you go into bed, um, qigong or different things that I've mentioned in the talk so far to at least uh, calm down your body. So you, even if your body's adapted to drinking coffee at night, that's fine. If you cannot give it up, I can't force you. <laughs> so just start implement some of those things, limiting electronic use, relaxing, uh, meditating, stretching, all these different things will help your body calm down. And, you know, if your body's, you know, resistant to uh, caffeine doesn't affect you, then at least other things can still help you. And just try to develop a routine where you can try to go to bed a little bit earlier than one o'clock. Like based on the Chinese medicine, just, you know, going to bed maybe a half an hour earlier this week and then increase it as you can every week. Sounds good. And uh, this one, I think, is really applicable to your last, uh, the second part of your presentation. Uh, we were talking about the different pressure points. How long should uh, one really massage these points each time? Like, you know, should they do it for a prolonged period of time or should they count up to a certain number? Uh, what, what would be suitable? Uh, average about 30 seconds to a minute um, because some people don't massage too hard when you bruise yourself because I, I had that happen. People keep massaging, massaging, massaging and then they, just, they forget and the next day they see a bruise. So if you bruise yourself uh, for some reason, just take a break for a few days until the bruise disappears. But usually on each side, you wanna do maybe 30 seconds to a minute, at the most two minutes. If your thumb gets tired, then just you know, give it a rest and then do the other side for a little bit. Um, and just gentle massage, you can have a little bit of tenderness, but not too much. Just don't go overboard. Mm -hmm. just, yeah, just listen to your body. I think that's the whole purpose. Absolutely. I think knowing your body is definitely uh, very, very important. That's for sure. Now, just the last two questions we have. Um, this one is, is interesting. It refers to the first portion of your presentation when you were talking about restless leg syndrome. Mm -hmm. And the question comes, what happens if you uh, observe kicking while you're asleep, though? Uh, kicking, that's normal. Some people may move, you know, when they're sleeping. As long as they're not having a severe, some people have like night tears or sleep disorders where they're kicking and they're screaming and they can hit their bed partner. And that's something you have to get checked out by a physician to do further study, like a sleep study. But if you have something jerking movements, those are okay. Those are our normal movements when you jerk a little bit. As long as you're not acting out your dream, that's the more the dangerous uh, warning signs. Some people like they wake up and they do things in the middle when they're sleeping and they don't remember. Those things I would be concerned about, but just, moving like jerking movements of your arm or your legs that's perfectly normal mm. and this one is from gene and uh, uh gene was actually wondering um because it seems like brainwave therapies uh have had a effect uh for gene to sleep better this year uh in addition to sort of ease medicine strategies uh do you have any uh feedback on uh binaural beats or isochronic tones etc I don't have a lot of experience in those, but I know some of those apps have different tones you can listen to in different beats and different frequencies. You can try it out. Um, I don't know the too much science behind that, unfortunately, but I know it's in the apps, like the Inside Timer have different tones you can listen to. You can try it to see if it helps you. I know there's like uh, brain waves or beat waves, something like this, different apps you can try that it emits different tones uh, to generate that sleep cycle. You can try it. I tried it myself. It didn't really work for me. So I think it depends on the individual. Some people think it's great. So I, I don't think there's any harm in it. There's no, uh, there's no detriment from trying mm -hmm. it. Sounds good. 
Sounds good. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Chang. I, I think it's been a great presentation for all of us. Uh, I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you would like to receive the YouTube links to a couple of suggested resources uh, from Dr. Reiki Chang, please leave us a message in the chat box uh, or send Monique uh, a message which she has posted earlier. Uh, we'll be happy to circulate those for you. Um, again, now, uh, we're unable to actually provide you the actual PowerPoint presentation, but certainly uh, we'll be able to share with you uh, the resources uh, that Dr. Ken uh, is providing here. Um, just in a couple of closing remarks, um, we have an event coming up, and it's really for us to promote healthy uh, meals, better meals, better uh, eating. And uh, it's really to suggest that vegetarianism is a very good source or a very good choice, I should say, uh, for many of us. Uh, if you would like to experience that, we definitely want to invite you uh, to our event that's upcoming uh, next week. As you see on the poster here, we have a couple of links. Uh, we will be more than happy uh, to welcome you to the event and at the same time ask you to support us in promoting uh, vegetarianism. And uh, next, uh, which is just a reminder, uh, we, our next webinar, June the 24th, and it is how to use OTC pain medicines. And uh, as you know, there have been a lot of choices for people to uh, buy over-the-counter medication, especially when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, pain and uh, Tylenols, ibuprofen, aspirin, et cetera. There are a lot of choices, and this, would be able to help you identify uh, which ones to take when and the general guidelines uh, for dosage control. So look forward to welcoming you. Again, it's also at 7 p.m. June 24th, uh, which is also a Wednesday, a couple of weeks from now. So uh, just as a quick reminder to everybody as well, uh, please keep posted on our new clinic developments on our website. Our videos of our previous webinars are generally available on YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you liked our seminar, which I think many of you said you have, please visit our website, uh, visit our Facebook as well. Uh, leave us a positive comment, give us a review. We'd love to hear from you. If you want us to a cover as well, please uh, feel free to communicate with us on our social media channels. Again, today's uh, presentation concludes here. I want to take this moment to say thank you again to Dr. Chang. Uh, it's been a great, great presentation for myself and I'm sure for a lot of us. So thank you once again for this presentation and uh, look forward to uh, our next webinar uh, with uh, Dr. Chang. So um, without further ado, uh, today's webinar closes now and uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Chang. Okay, thank you so much, Kevin. I just wanted to share the screen of resources, PDF files. So if anyone is sure. interested, uh, send an email out. Um, someone will send this PDF that has different sleep tips, different apps, and the acupressure that we did, and different supplements we talked about, and some links to YouTube, Qigong, yoga, and different forms of meditation, and some stuff for self massage that you can try. Okay, well, thank you so much, guys. I hope uh, you found this helpful. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night. Hope Good you night. sleep well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.